This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. And here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. When you see continued impunity for serious violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law, it emboldens the perpetrators. That's UN Human Rights Spokeswoman Ravina Shamadassini on concerns that hundreds of thousands of Sudanese face violence, abuse and exploitation while fleeing their homes. Details coming up. Also, hundreds of thousands of workers in Cameroon marched for May Day calling for raises. And South African officials are in Washington amid concerns that close ties with China and Russia are harming relations with America. These stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. There are reports of fierce fighting today between Sudan's army and the paramilitary RSF despite the extension of a truce. The United Nations says the leaders of the two sides have agreed to talks and warns the humanitarian situation has reached a breaking point. Douglas Mpuga compiled the following report. The United Nations top official for Sudan says the country's warring generals have agreed to send representatives for negotiations potentially in Saudi Arabia. The Associated Press on Monday reported the plan for talks even as the two sides clashed in the capital despite three days' extension of a fragile ceasefire. The AP reports UN envoy Volker Perthes says the talks initially will focus on establishing a stable and reliable ceasefire monitored by national and international observers. The string of temporary truces over the past week has de-escalated fighting in some areas, while in others, fierce battles continue to drive civilians from their homes and push the country into a humanitarian crisis. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said Sunday he was immediately sending Martin Griffiths, his emergency relief coordinator, to the area. UN officials say Griffiths will work to help bring immediate relief to the millions of people whose lives turned upside down overnight. The French news agency AFP reports that more than 500 people have been killed since fighting erupted on April 15th. Sudan's de facto leader, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, who leads the regular army, and his ex-deputy Mohamed Hamdan Daglo, who commands the powerful paramilitary rapid support forces, began fighting after talks for a transitional civilian government stalled. Burhan and Dagalo have agreed on multiple poorly observed ceasefires and extended the latest truce on Sunday by 72 hours. Each side has blamed the other for the frequent violations. Abdel Fattah al-Burhani spoke to the Arabic-language TV channel Al-Hura, an independent news organization largely funded by the U.S. Agency for Global Media, VOA's parent agency. Burhani says he has suggested to Dagalo that they both resign from the leadership of the army and the RSF and let others take the lead. Burhani says Dagalo replied by saying Burhani should go and he will stay in place. RSF leader Dagalo told the Saudi Arabian language television Ashak News on Monday that he has no objection to negotiations with the army, provided that a ceasefire is adhered to and trust-building measures are taken. Dagalo went on to say the only issue to be negotiated with the leadership of the army is a return to a December 2022 framework agreement where both factions agreed to remain outside the political process and hand power to civilians. Since the fighting began, millions of Sudanese have been trapped in their homes, facing shortages of food, water, power, and medicines. Tens of thousands have fled to Port Sudan or other locations while foreign governments are evacuating their citizens. Former Sudanese Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok is calling on the international community to keep pressure on the warring sides in the conflict. At the 2023 Mo Ibrahim Foundation Governance Weekend in Kenya, he said he remained an optimist about Sudan. 
Transitions by their nature, they are non-linear. They never travel in a straight line. They have their ups and downs. It, is, it was our unity that toppled the dictatorship. And we should not lose track on that. Yeah. We should have been staying the course yeah. as a unified front. And I was telling them time and again that to protect the transition, we need to stay unified. In 2019, a popular uprising ousted the government of long-time dictator Omar al-Bashir. Hamdok was installed as prime minister in a transitional civilian military government, but was forced out when the military took control of the government in 2021. He made his comments in a discussion with Mo Ibrahim at the Ibrahim Foundation's Governance Weekend. For VOA News, I'm Douglas Impuga in Washington. The United Nations World Food Program says it is resuming operations in Sudan after a pause of more than two weeks prompted by the killing of three staff members. The UN is also sending its chief emergency relief coordinator to the East African country, as Michael Atit reports from Port Sudan. The World Food Program said in a statement Monday that it has lifted its suspension of operations in Sudan as the fighting there threatens millions with hunger. The WFP said distribution of food is expected to commence in the states of Gadarif, Jazeera, Kasala and White Nile in the coming days to provide the life-saving assistance that many so desperately need right now. The agency said... We will take utmost care to ensure the safety of all our staff and partners as we rush to meet the growing needs of the most vulnerable. The WFP suspended operations when three staff members were killed in the first day of the conflict between Sudan's army and the paramilitary unit, the Rapid Support Forces. The WFP noted that more than 15 million people faced severe food insecurity in Sudan before the conflict began and said it expects the number to grow significantly as the fighting continues. Meanwhile, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has dispatched UN Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffiths to Sudan to assess the situation there. Writing on Twitter from Nairobi, Kenya, Monday, Griffiths said, We need to find ways to get aid into the country and distribute it to those in need as well as protect civilians, ensure safe passage for people fleeing the hostilities, and facilitate relief operations. Griffiths is expected to arrive on Tuesday. Michael Atid for VOA News, Port Sudan. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights reports hundreds of thousands of Sudanese civilians are facing violence, abuse, and exploitation while fleeing their homes in search of safety. Lisa Schlein reports from Geneva. Since fighting broke out between the Sudanese Armed Forces and paramilitary Rapid Support Forces two weeks ago, United Nations officials say there has been a dramatic deterioration in the human rights situation in the country. And this, they say, has increased the fear, deprivation, and trauma of people who are seeing their hopes for a democratic society slip away as competing forces fight for power. UN Human Rights Spokeswoman Irvina Shamdasani says thousands of people trapped in residential areas of intense fighting are subject to mistreatment and abuse while fleeing from airstrikes and shelling. People continue to be forced from their homes by the RSF and suffer looting, extortion, acute shortages of food, water, electricity, fuel, and limited access to health care and cash due to the closure of banks, as well as limited communications. Fighting broke out on April 15th between the Sudan Armed Forces, led by General Abdel Fattah al-Borhan and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, commanded by General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, or Hamidi. The two generals led a military government that ousted a civilian military transitional administration in 2021, but argued over talks to create a new civilian government. Shamdasani notes, fierce fighting continues in densely populated areas of Khartoum, Bari, Omdurman, and towns in Darfur and North Kordofan, despite ceasefire agreements between the warring parties. She says reports of prison breaks and of inmates 
inmates being released or escaping is alarming, given the long history of impunity in the country. She adds, UN Rights Chief Volker Turk thinks impunity is at the root of a lot of what is happening today. When you see continued impunity for serious violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law, it emboldens the perpetrators. Uh, and we are very concerned that uh, you know, prison releases or escapes um, have also led to um, potential war criminals um, having been released. Uh, this is of, of deep concern. Shamdasani says concern is rising that the conflict will trigger intercommunal violence in West Darfur. She notes clashes in El Janina in West Darfur reportedly have killed about 100 people since April 24th. She warns the environment of impunity and lawlessness is creating a situation that is ripe for further violence. She says it is a dangerous breeding ground for opportunistic criminal violence as well as for long-standing ethnic Tensions. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. In Cameroon, hundreds of thousands of workers marched on the May 1st International Labor Day, calling for wage increases amid price hikes fueled by Russia's war on Ukraine. Cameroon's trade unions want minimum wages for workers doubled to $200 per month, while employers argue the price hikes make such a raise impossible. Moki Edwin Kinzeka reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. These Cameroonian workers are singing in French that they deserve better wages. In the song, they say Cameroon is developing socially and economically due to its labor force, yet workers are poorly paid. Abraham Babuli is a representative of the Confederation of Cameroon Workers' Trade Unions. He is one of the organizers of the Labor Day celebration and the march in Yaoundé. The leaders amelioration the condition of life of workers. Babuli says trade union leaders unanimously agreed to mobilize workers in all Cameroonian towns and villages to press for better working conditions. He says both the state of Cameroon and private employers do not respect legal contracts that outline employment terms and conditions and either illegally dismiss workers or refuse to pay their wages. Babuli says price hikes caused by Russia's war in Ukraine and armed conflicts are making it very, very difficult for workers to make ends meet. Babuli said trade unions in Cameroon want the government and private employers to double the monthly minimum wage to $200 and increase all workers' salaries by at least 25%. Workers say since Russia's invasion of Ukraine 15 months ago, many households are going hungry because prices for commodities exported by the two countries, such as wheat, maize, and fertilizer, have increased by 40%. The price of fuel has also increased by more than 15%. The government gave workers a 5% pay raise in February, but workers say with inflation so high, the raise is negligible. The Cameroon government says more than 30,000 workers marched in Yaoundé on Monday and hundreds of thousands marched in other towns and villages. Cameroon Minister of Labor and Social Security Grégoire Ona says the world's financial crisis makes it impossible for the state and private investors to satisfy the needs of all workers. La situation générale du travailleur au Cameroon. He says Cameroon is not the only country where unemployment and inflation are high and bankrupt companies are either closing or reducing their labor force because of economic shocks and the climate crisis. He says despite the morose atmosphere, the future is promising because the government is finalizing negotiations with local and foreign investors who have indicated their willingness to invest in Cameroon. International Labor Day activities were suspended in Cameroon in 2020 after the first cases of COVID-19 were reported in the Central African state. 
Workers say for three years they were unable to demonstrate in large numbers and press for higher wages and better job protection. Moki Edwin Kinzuka for VOA News, Yawundi, Cameroon. Eight farmers were killed yesterday in an attack blamed on a militant group targeting three villages in northeast DRC, a local official said. Adu Bango Kivya told the French news agency AFP from the district of Jugu in Ituru province that members of Kodeko, or Cooperative for the Development of the Congo, attacked the villages of Duvari, Njalo, and Bengi. Kodeko says it is protecting the Lendu community from another ethnic group, the Hema, as well as the DRC army. The Hema are defended by the Zaire militia, while the province is also targeted by the Allied Democratic Forces, ADF, linked to the Islamic State jihadist group. Eastern Congo is plagued by dozens of armed groups, many of which are a legacy of regional wars that flared in the 1990s and 2000s. AFP says Ituru province is one of the violent hotspots where attacks claiming dozens of lives are routine. The last attack blamed on Kodeko killed more than 40 people on April 14th in villages near the provincial capital of Bunia. Senior South African government officials have been in Washington since Friday to meet with counterparts from the Biden administration. The visits happening amid concerns from President Cyril Ramaphosa that South Africa's close ties with China and Russia are harming its economic and political relations with America. Darren Taylor explains. The South African delegation is led by Ramaphosa's security adviser, Sidney Mufamadi, a top African National Congress, ANC, member. The team wants assurances that Washington will not eject South Africa from the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA. This law has given some African countries duty and quota-free access to U.S. markets for products since 2000. International relations expert Peter Fabricius says South Africa exported goods worth 60 billion rands, almost three and a half billion dollars, to the U.S. under AGOA in 2022. It's quite beneficial, particularly for like auto manufacturers. We export quite a few autos there. Also, processed food, you know, fruit and so on, fruit juices and other things. And it's also symbolic in a way because it's a kind of a confidence building thing for other traders and investors and so on to know that we have that relationship. But he says growing numbers of influential American politicians are unhappy with the ANC government. They think Pretoria is moving away from being non-aligned in the war in Ukraine to being a firm ally of President Vladimir Putin. Examples include South Africa's recent joint military exercises with China and Russia, while declining to participate in one led by the U.S., a move Professor Chris Isike of the University of Pretoria calls a strategic mistake. South Africa needs to take a critical look at this from a national interest point of view, from economic interest point of view, where its bread is being buttered. Currently, its bread is better buttered by trade relations with the United States, which is far, far higher in volumes than whatever it has with Russia. Fabricia says members of the U.S. Congress are also upset that the South African government made it clear it won't arrest Putin if he visits the country for a summit in August. The International Criminal Court, the ICC, has issued a war crimes warrant against the Russian leader. As an ICC member, South Africa is obliged to take him into custody if he arrives in the country. It's mainly the Republicans who are unhappy with South Africa's business. I mean, look, the administration, Democrat, also not so happy, but, you know, Biden tends to be quite sympathetic. He had uh, Ramaphosa to visit in September on a state visit, which was quite a big Isike deal. doesn't think Washington will risk driving a key African country further into the China-Russia camp by cutting trade ties with it. He also points out the ANC is currently doing something that no Western power is able to do 
meeting with Russian government officials in Moscow. There is an advantage South Africa has and which may benefit the United States in terms of South Africa's ability to be able to talk to, to Russia to help to resolve the conflict in line with its stated foreign policy goal and its commitment to peaceful resolution of conflict. In essence, South Africa does have linkages to Ukraine and Russia, and I think that it presents an opportunity to help the United States to have a, a connection, however indirect that may be, to help to resolve this conflict. Ramaphosa's spokesperson, Vincent Maguenya, told VOA the president hasn't received any indication that the U.S. government intends to impose punitive measures against South Africa for anything. But Fabricia says Ramaphosa wouldn't send a special delegation to Washington if he wasn't worried about something that could threaten future American-South African relations. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. VOA Africa is your trusted source for news, sports, entertainment and music. Stay engaged with VOA Africa. We love to hear your voice. You can call us 24-7 on WhatsApp and leave a message. Leave comments, requests or greetings. We may play your message on VOA Africa. Dial the international code PLUS1. Then 202-258-3076. VOA Africa is always happy to hear your voice. The number again is the international code plus one. Then 202-258-3076. Nigerian police say they arrested eight separatists suspected of killing six people last month in the country's troubled southeast. The suspects have all confessed to members of the dreadful IPOBESN syndicate terrorizing the good people of Imo State and had a hand in the recent killings of four police officers and two civilians, according to state police statement. IPOB is the indigenous people of Biafra movement, which wants a separate state for the Igbo people in southwest Nigeria, while the ESN is its armed wing, the Eastern Security Network. AFP reports that attacks blamed on IPOB have left dozens of police officers dead in the last two years in southeastern Nigeria, just one of several security crises confronting President-elect Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Local government offices and electoral agency buildings have also been targeted. IPOB denies any responsibility. And that wraps up this 